نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek His guidance and His blessings and His assistance. And we put our complete trust in Allah. We bear witness there is nothing in this universe worthy of serving, of bowing before, of submitting to, of obeying, except for Allah. And, he, and we bear witness that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is His last and His final messenger. O you who believe, be mindful of Allah, be conscious of Allah. In a way Allah has a right that we be conscious and in awe of Him. And do not die unless you die in a state of submission, in a state of Islam. Wabad. My dearest brothers and sisters, we are living in a world where the pursuit of truth seems often to be a very rare and elusive thing. It seems as if oftentimes, uh, whenever we're confronted with information or we meet somebody, there's always some thought in the back of our minds that is this person or this entity or this channel, am I even hearing anything which is true anymore? Because the frequency of misinformation, of lying, of deception has reached such proportions that people are skeptical of all information out there. And so an example of kind of the extent to which this is true, we see that in this modern culture, for instance, we are told that we value freedom of opinion and diversity of values and we tolerate different ways of being. Yet when that different way of being conflicts with what the liberal dominant culture wants, then they say, no, 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 we don't like that type of tolerance. So you see this form of hypocrisy and deception and lying in what they say. Or at a more personal level, in the world today we find is as people are in the work from home, digital working environment, and people are trying to get jobs and their professional personas and their, and their resumes and their CVs and their LinkedIn profiles, half the time you read somebody's profile and you have absolutely no idea what's true from what's false. People put all kinds of false skills they have, false experiences, false degrees, all under the guise of, well, everyone else is doing it. And so this proliferation of misinformation, even the most basic thing of when someone has a social media profile and the persona which they put out there on that profile may not match any form of reality out there. And so all of this has created this deep level of public mistrust of information and skepticism around everything that we see, we see happening before us. In short, I believe this is a problem of hypocrisy in many ways. It's a problem of systematic hypocrisy in the world where the things that they say and the values they uphold, they do not actually practice in any way, shape, or form. And hypocrisy actually is, it's a threat to public well-being and safety. Because once there is a level of hypocrisy and deception out there, and people do not trust the information, and people are skeptical of what they hear, and that people never feel settled, then it's very hard to, to function in such a world. And so what we mean by hypocrisy here, we mean the difference between someone living a life in private that's different in public, or somebody who says that we should live one way, but they actually live in a completely different way. And the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam himself, one of the biggest challenges that he faced as the messenger of Allah and as the head of state was the existence of hypocrites in his society. Because hypocrites, like I said, will spread misinformation. Hypocrites will cause confusion. And that has a lot of consequences on the well-being of the state. And so much so that in fact the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he was told by his own companions that these hypocrites that live amongst us, they're undermining the well-being and the safety of the state. They're willing to set you up for assassination. They're willing to cause massive uh, death and loss of life to the Muslims. Why don't we do something about them? Why don't we even, you know, we can, we can hold them accountable, we can discipline them, and even if they're treacherous, execute them. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu understood that he could not do such a thing. He said, even if you were to take a treacherous person who could cause a lot of loss of life, and if he said, if I had to do this, then the people all around, the media all around would say that Muhammad is killing his companions. So the media machine would latch on to that behavior of his and even doing something good would create a public relations nightmare.
for the sake of Muslims and the Islamic State. We have done a number of studies, my dear brothers and sisters, on Muslims all over America. So studies on converts, studies on born Muslims, and one of the biggest threats to one's religiosity, one of the biggest causes of people leaving Islam or doubting Islam has been reported to be the hypocrisy of fellow believers. That people report that when they see other Muslims who claim to be a certain way, then acting to very, very differently, it makes them doubt whether this is the right religion or not. So hypocrisy in this way, my dear brothers and sisters, is a public safety issue as well as an issue of the well-being of one's religiosity. And so there's a big concern in Islam about what is hypocrisy and how do we deal with it. The ulama of Islam, they used to say that a beautiful statement attributed to Al-Hassan al-Basri and also to Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya. He said, مَا خَافَ nifaq illa mu'min wala aminahu illa al-munafiq illa munafiq That this is such a serious topic that they said that nobody is fearful of hypocrisy except a real believer. And no one feels completely safe and secure from it except for a hypocrite. In other words, it's a topic that should be on the mind of the believer to make sure that we're living a life that is consistent with the beliefs that we hold. Do we walk the way that we talk? And if we do not, if we don't do that, then to understand there's serious consequences to that. Consequences for our own well-being in this life, consequences for our well-being in the afterlife, and also a consequence on the faith of other people around us. And the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, this is why the punishment for hypocrisy is one of the most severe punishments in Islam. As Allah said in the Quran, He said that in al munafiqina fi darkil asfali min nar Indeed, the hypocrites are in the lowest depths of hellfire. So this khutbah, my dear brothers and sisters, is not just to instill this deep fear and to have any accusations to make everyone question their faith. That is not the point. But the point is for us to have a balanced approach to saying, you know what, we can't just be heedless of what we do and think that everything's fine and dandy, nor should we be so obsessive and scared that it paralyzes us and causes us a lot of distress. And the companions used to ask these questions all the time. Omar ibn Khattab, عن, he used to go to Hudayfa, uh, who the Prophet had entrusted with the knowledge of, of the hypocrites, and said, when these people die, he said, don't pray upon them. And when you don't pray upon them, the Muslims will know they were hypocrites. So Omar used to go to Hudayfa and say, am I a hypocrite? Am I a hypocrite? And Hudayfa would tell him no. And there's a lot of stories we'll cover about this, inshallah. But the Prophet gave us one hadith, I'll just speak about this one hadith quickly, where he gave us some uh, indicators of hypocrisy we can look into for our own lives. A very simple litmus test. And the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam he said in an authentic narration, he said, min alamat al-munafiq thalafa. He said, there are three signs or indicators of a hypocrite. Wa in sama wa salla wa za'ama annahu Muslim. This is even if the person prays, fast, and claims to be a Muslim. And he said, Ida haddatha kathab. Number one, that if the person speaks, they have no problem and they lie. Number two, Ida wa'ada akhlaf. That if they make a promise, they can break that promise. And number three, Ida tumina khan. And if they are entrusted with something, they betray that trust. So in this hadith, we have for us a simple test that we can all use for ourselves, that we should use every now and then to evaluate the state of our belief. The same way we evaluate other things in life. We all will evaluate you know, our, our, our professional lives and if we're heading the right direction, right, and our financial lives and our marital lives and everything else. Evaluate your faith and say, where am I when it comes to congruence between my beliefs and my behaviors? And the first thing is to evaluate when we speak, are we truthful or not? When we speak, are we truthful or not? In other words, when we engage in any business transactions, will we speak the truth, even if that might cost us a sale? When we speak to our wives or our parents or our husbands or our brothers or our sisters, do we speak the truth, even if that truth might get us in trouble? If we're at school and we have an exam or homework, do we do what's right and speak the truth about it, right? Or do we lie and cheat in some other fashion? So the number one thing and one of the biggest indicators of hypocrisy is incongruence between right, what we're saying and the reality of those words. This is why Allah says in the Quran, Ya amanu wa qulu qawlan sadida. You have to speak words, a true believer, words that are accurate. Because accuracy in words leads to Allah elevating one's rank, forgiving one's sins, and all kinds of other good outcomes in this life. Amongst them, public trust. Amongst them, 
a sense of, of, uh, of camaraderie and, and brotherliness. Because if people feel as if when somebody speaks, I can't trust that word, how do we build a community? So number one is ensuring that our words match the reality. Number two is making promises. Do we make promises that we keep or do we make promises that we often break? And it's, an, it's part of human nature to make promises to people because you want to put people at, 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 at comfort. Say, you know, I promise I'll do this. We might tell our wives, we might tell our husbands, we might tell our employer, I promise I'll get you this uh, you know, on this day. I promise I'll do this and I promise I'll do that. But continuously breaking those promises, again, leads to the individual being humiliated in the eyes of people and people then feeling the sense of hopelessness that I can never trust this person. And number three is when we are entrusted with something to betray that trust. When people tell us something important, a secret about their lives, a struggle that they're having, some financial you know, information or even money that's given. Do we ever break that and violate that trust and tell that to other people? These are three indicators that if one is regularly doing these things, and these are things that we should really be worried about the state of our faith. But it's not to say, and this is where we should transition the khutbah from being very, very mindful and fearful of the potential of hypocrisy to also not the other side of it. Because every single human being except for the prophets of Allah, they will make mistakes and they will sin. You, me, everyone in this room, doesn't matter who we are, we will sin. All the time until we die, we will commit mistakes. If we did not commit mistakes, we'd either be angels or we're prophets. But the problem is not in committing the mistake. The problem is how we react to it. Either denying that that is a mistake or saying, or covering up that mistake and saying that we did not do something when we did something, that's the bigger issue here. And so what I want to transition is how the companions thought about hypocrisy and how the prophet corrected their misunderstanding. Because someone, I don't want anyone to now think that, well, this khutbah has told me I've lied before. I've broken a promise. I've betrayed someone's trust. I must be a hypocrite. I'm going to hellfire. That's not what we're trying to say. We're saying be vigilant of these indicators just like if you have a symptom of something, someone could have a symptom of a disease and not have the disease. It's just a symptom. But if you habitually lie, break trust, and betray people, then those are indicators that one might be on a path towards hypocrisy. Second part of the khutbah will speak about how the companions understood this and how the Prophet corrected their misunderstandings. Allah, the one who repents from his sins, is like the one who is sinless. So ask Allah to forgive us of all of our shortcomings and our mistakes. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatan wa salaman ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi man wala huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al haqq li yudhhirahu ala deen kulli wa kafa billahi shahida my dear brothers and sisters we were speaking about the presence of hypocrisy in the world and that is something very common that we might see with other people or with our government or with other institutions but our concern today is with ourselves because the change of a world and the change of our condition and our communities depends on the change of every single one of us. And so to look into our own hearts and lives and say, are we living a life that is congruent with what we believe and what we value? And if there's a mismatch, how do we fix that? And so the companions, they understood this idea and they thought long and hard about it. And sometimes we think the companions instantly by saying, that by living in the presence of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu knew every single detail about Islam. They themselves had a lot of of misunderstandings and confusion points as well. And they would go and express that to the Prophet Muhammad And so uh, Anas ibn Maliki narrates uh, this, this narration where he said that the, the, messengers, uh, the messengers, the companions would come to the Prophet Muhammad and say things like, Oh Messenger of Allah, when we're with you, sitting in your presence, we are in one state of being. And we're in the spiritual high. Right? We feel so good about our faith. We feel close to Allah. Right? We feel close to our faith. We're really, really just secure and spiritual. But when we're not around you, we're in a different state. And so they're wondering, they said, is this hypocrisy? And the Prophet Muhammad he said, how are you? He asked two questions. How are you with your Lord? And they said, Allah is our Lord in public and in private. And then he said, and how are you with your Prophet? And they said, you are a prophet in public and in private. He goes, and this is not hypocrisy. 
And what he means in this hadith is that what it's to be in two different states, want to the, the natural way that we are as human beings. That is not the problem. Is that you feel really, really religious in the masjid. You feel very, very spiritually high after you heard a lecture or after you read the Quran. And then after going to work for eight hours, you don't feel that high. That's not hypocrisy. Because one believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just in public by telling people, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then in private, they act as if God does not exist and that the Prophet's words don't matter. So as long as people believe in Allah and His Messenger in public and in private and do their best to live by that, then that is not hypocrisy. And so another companion came and he elaborated on this. And this is the companion, Hanbala, radiallahu anhu. And he himself was extremely distressed one day. Very distressed. And he's walking around the streets, pacing. And he runs into who else but Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr sees him distressed. He goes, what's, Hanbala, how are you doing? You okay? Hanbala said, Hanbala is a munafiq. Hanbala is a hypocrite, speaking in, in, the, in the third person. And Abu Bakr said, what? come on, what's going on? Why would you think you're a hypocrite? He says, when I'm in the presence of the Messenger of Allah, he's like, it's as if I can see heaven and hell. This my feeling of my faith and connection to the afterlife. It is just like vivid in my mind. And then when I leave the Messenger of Allah, I got my wife, I got my kids, I got my business, and I really am not thinking about the hereafter too often. He goes, that is why I'm a hypocrite. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, also a very knowledgeable companion, the most knowledgeable of all, he goes, I do the exact same thing. Maybe I'm a hypocrite too. So they go to the Prophet wasallam, and they say to him, Ya Rasulullah, Hanbala says, I'm a hypocrite. The Prophet says, what's going on, Hanbala? Why would you say that? He goes, when I'm with you, I feel like this, I feel like that, I see Jannah, I see Hellfire, I feel so good. And then I go to my wife, my kids, my job, and I don't feel that anymore. And he said, Ya Hanbala, if you were to remain in that spiritual high when you're with me throughout the entire day, he goes, and the angels would practically be like shaking your hands the entire day. But he said, but Hamdala, sa'a wa sa'a. He said, but Hamdala, that's not how life was meant to be. Life is not meant to be in a spiritual high where you feel like nothing but the hereafter is on your mind and you literally see Jannah and you're running towards it or you see hellfire and you're running away from it. He goes, but there's a time for business and for wives and for kids and for and for dunya, and there's a time for faith. And so here we have a beautiful narration that gives us, again, balance. Now, some people take this hadith to say, well, I guess we don't have to really worry about religion anymore because Prophet said, sa'a wa sa, right? What this means is that Hamdala was balanced, though. He would give time for his faith and would be elevated in his faith during that time, and the natural course of life would erode some of those thoughts and ideas, and he'd have to come back for that reminder to continue to get that. It's almost like food, right? No one eats and then says, I'm done eating, right? You go and you eat and you feel nourished and then the, the day passes and you get hungry and you have to eat again. So it's a cycle, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ is telling Hamdara what we all need to be mindful of living a life that has a cyclical nature. Go and seek knowledge of your faith. Go and sit amongst the righteous. Go and open the Quran. Do things that nourish your soul. But you can't do that all day long because we did not create you that way. You have human needs, right? you have a community you live in, you have a family, you have a job, you have all these other responsibilities. And when you go and you do all those things, you're going to feel that depletion of spiritual resources, and so you come back to it. So for all of us to remember here today, that we're not hypocrites because we don't feel religious all the time. We're not hypocrites because sometimes we make mistakes. We're not hypocrites if, we, if, if, if sometimes you know, our, our lives are not in perfect congruence. But we try to live that balanced lifestyle. That when we're feeling low, we go and we fill that spiritual low at the masjid, right? Listening to righteous reminders, reading the Quran, and all kinds of other good behaviors. I'll conclude in the few minutes that I have with just two other narrations. I won't get to the, the final piece, which is not just behaviors, but also thoughts. Because sometimes in the world that we live in today, especially for the young people, the intellectual challenges and the spiritual challenges are immense. There's always something that's trying to question what you believe in and make you question and undermine our beliefs. And again, I'm here to remind you all, the companions felt this as well. Before Fox News, before crazy extremists, right, uh, you know, are out there, Republicans are out there saying all kinds of Islamophobia. Before all that, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu 
in Mecca, in Medina, the companions would feel some of these same ideas would come to their mind. And so they began to worry. And so a companion came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and he said, Verily we perceive in our minds that which any of us would ever consider far too grave to express. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, Do you actually perceive those things? Meaning, do you really get these thoughts and ideas that you know are really just not appropriate? And the man, he said, yes. And look at the Prophet's answer here. He said, that is pure faith. Now, what does that mean, that is pure faith? Meaning, it's not purity of faith to expect that we will never get ideas that are un-Islamic. Whether it be theological ideas that pop into our minds, whether it be any other ideas that are unholy or not wholesome, that is the nature of being a human being. And if you were not a human being, then you wouldn't have those. But we're all human beings, so we will have those feelings. And so the Prophet is saying, the goal is not to ever say we will not get those thoughts. But it's when you get those thoughts that you don't verbalize them and you don't act upon them, which shows that one has faith. I mean, we all do that every single day, right? Whenever, whenever we are, if you're talking to somebody, you might want to say something to that person, right? Something that might be bothering you about that person. But you hold back because out of respect for that person, right? Out of just being right, a decent, dignified person, sometimes you watch your words and you just keep that thought in your mind and there's no need to express it. The same thing with your faith. There will be ideas that creep into your mind. Just the shaitan will whisper things into one's soul and if one then says, well, let me go and post this on social media and let me go and act upon this, then that will erode one's faith. And so the last narration, and we'll close with this, is that another man, he came, building on the same idea, a man, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, O Messenger of Allah, one of us has thoughts of such nature that we would rather be reduced to ashes and coal than to speak about them. And the Messenger of Allah, again, he didn't get upset about it. He said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He goes, praise be to Allah who has limited what the shaitan can do to thoughts and whispers in the minds of people. In conclusion, my dear brothers and sisters, hypocrisy is a serious threat to public well-being in the world. Not just religious hypocrisy, but general hypocrisy. Religious hypocrisy is a threat to our well-being in this life, in the next life, and to the faith of others. Be mindful of it and try to live a life where you sit down, evaluate your values, and see if your behaviors match those values. And surely they will not always because that is the nature of being a human being. And surely we will get thoughts and ideas that creep into our minds and we might even get doubts at times. Get those doubts addressed in private if you need to. Come to the scholars, come to the masjid, seek religious expertise. But do not just uh, fee add fuel to those thoughts. And as Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah, he said this actually to his great student, Ibn Qayyim. He said that, he told Ibn Qayyim, he said, that be, don't be like a sponge. Because a sponge, whatever it touches, it soaks it up. He says, every doubt that you encounter, do not be like a sponge that soaks up those doubts into your heart. But he said, let your heart be like glass, that a doubt, when it hits it, it'll just glide smoothly over it. And that's how we want to be, to preserve our faith, to be those who are congruent, in private and in public, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our iman. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of sidq, of, of truth, of trustworthiness and truthfulness. Allah mahdina fi man hadith, wa afina fi man afayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa barakana fi man atayt, inna ka taqadi bil haqqi subhanak wa laikudu alayk, wa laka shukrana bi man atayt. Nastaghfiruk Allah min jami'a dhunun bil khutai wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atana fi dunya hasana fil akhir, hasana wa qina adha banar. Allah, we ask you to give peace and comfort to the Muslims who are suffering all over the world. Allah, we ask you to bring victory to the Muslims who are struggling in all the lands where they're being oppressed, in Palestine, in Kashmir, in China, in Iraq, in Yemen, Afghanistan, everywhere, oh Allah, the Muslims are being, are, are, are being harmed. Please be at their aid. Oh Allah, protect our faith. Oh Allah, protect us from hypocrisy. Oh Allah, make our words true. Make us fulfill our promises. Oh Allah, make us fulfill our trust. And O oh Allah, that we have gathered us here today, gather us in the highest gardens of paradise with the righteous and with the martyrs and the prophets. Waqimu salat inna salatatan al fahshai wal munkar wa la dhikr wa akbar. Wallahu ya'lamu ma tasna'un. As you line up for the salah, a few quick announcements. Uh, salah will be changing this Sunday. Fajr will be at 6 a.m. Fajr at 6. Asr, 4.45. Asr again, 4.45. And Aisha will be at 8.30. Uh, there's an FFN tonight at 8 o'clock p.m. with Sheikh Tariq, the Imam from Mission Viejo, titled A Beautiful Heart, The Five Foundational Characteristics. 
and the IOC Dawa Department in ICNA Relief will have a drive-through diaper distribution today. Uh, it will be at 345 here. Please enter from the placentia side gate. Allah <laughs>